I have released a book about real estate and here is what's in it. Investing for freedom. Building wealth one house at a time. Written by Lars Dierendorf. Introduction. I find one of the simplest way to invest in real estate also being the best. It's buying and holding single family homes. If you want to be a real estate investor, you will need to invest in real estate. To me, that means buying a property. No real estate investment trusts, no investment groups, no stocks in real estate companies, and no indirect investments or complicated get rich quick schemes. In this book, I want us to focus on how to become a real real estate investor by investing in real properties that you take ownership of. Chapter 1. Where to buy. The story. <laughs> Dipping. No, no, no. The story is that something we'll save for you readers of the book. The facts. Houses in good locations close to the center of popular cities are very expensive. A lot of investors never get started because they can't afford to buy a house where they live or want to live. Houses located far away from cities, public transport, and shopping are generally much cheaper. The problem with them is that not many people want to live there. The houses located in the middle, between the two areas mentioned above, are usually the safest investments. These include houses in suburbs or in fairly popular small towns. Houses in great locations historically have had the best appreciation. Houses in cheap locations have the best cash flow. Houses in the middle have a bit of both, which, over time, has made them an attractive investment for making income as an owner and also harvesting the fruit of inflating real estate prices. Like these two block houses. Chapter 2. Understanding, Understanding the market. You can always buy a house, but the real estate market is ever-changing, and you will do better deals if you understand it and adapt to its fluctuations. So let's say for a hot market, when there's a lot of buyers for every seller, you might need to find ways to buy deals that are not on the market. You can find for sale by owner, or find distressed properties that you can get hold of, or direct mail to people that are selling distressed properties. Versus if there's a slow market, you technically will make a great deal no matter what property you buy. Chapter three, a good deal made better. If you can find a property that needs some tender love and care, you will often find that the discount on that property is greater than the money it costs to fix that property back up. It's therefore often a good idea to buy a house that needs something repaired. Below is a list of things that might help you get an idea. The windows are cracked or busted. The house is in rough shape and needs restoring. The yard is a mess and needs cleaning up. The house has mold that needs to be removed. The place has no space to park cars. The realtor is hopeless to deal with. The house needs paint or a new roof. The cellar is unusually hard to deal with. The floors need replacing. There is an attic that can be used to increase living space. There is molding missing. The carpet is nasty and needs to be replaced. The kitchen is outdated. The house is dirty. Someone drove a car through the garage door. And the list goes on. Chapter four, what to buy. Ideally, since we're planning to, to hold these houses for a while and rent them, we want them to be as solid as possible. The most solid house we know of is a block house on a concrete slab with a tin roof. Now, those are hard to come by and, and many other investors have learned that they are what to prefer as well. So you might have to compromise in certain areas. But as a general rule, look for block houses on a concrete slab with a tin roof because they will last you the longest with the least amount of work to maintain them. Chapter five, how to buy. There are a lot of different ways to buy a house. You can buy it from an owner, you can buy it through a realtor, you can buy it in an auction, 
from a bank. All different ways are good ways, but there are certain things to look out for with each specific way of buying. If you buy from an owner or from an auction, for instance, you might want to make sure you do your homework to check so there's no liens on the property or any other unforeseen surprises, then you most likely won't get much of an inspection period on a house like that. If you buy from a realtor, you'll be paying some extra money for the house to pay for the commission of the realtor. But all ways are good ways as long as you know what to buy and what numbers you're looking for. Chapter 6. Negotiations. Your goal is to buy a house that makes you a lot of money. In order for you to buy that house, someone needs to sell it. For a deal to take place, you, as a buyer, have to agree with the seller on price and terms. Finding sellers who are willing to sell you their property under market value allows you to create immediate equity. That helps minimize potential losses if the market declines shortly after your purchase. In order to buy a property under market value, you will most likely have to negotiate. For successful negotiations to take place, you need to know what you want and try to get as close to that as possible. For a real chance to influence the price significantly, you will have to be one of the few buyers with a seller who is motivated to sell. As you enter discussions about the price, you will benefit from knowing how powerful your position is. The word negotiation originates from Latin and also means a discussion aimed at reaching an agreement. People throwing lowball offers left and right are not negotiating. The start of your negotiation should be to find out why the seller is selling and how they would like the deal to look. What would they like to walk away with? What would they like the future of the property to be? Make a serious effort to understand what they want and value. Seldom do you win by being arrogant and just rude. Try to be a good sport about it and look at it as a game. Chapter 7. How to pay and one of the longest chapters in the book. The saying, cash is king, can be very true in real estate. No matter whether or not you finance, your end goal should always be to own your properties free and clear. Paying properties off is our way of securing our financial future and getting true freedom from our real estate investments. The money we borrow is just that borrowed. A good investment property can produce enough income to pay itself off. In what other business can you borrow all the money needed to purchase something that then makes enough money to pay itself off with interest, hand you some cash every month, and appreciate in value while doing so? How to buy a house with the help of banks. How to buy a house with the help of owner finance. How to buy a house with the help of family, friends, or investors. Chapter 8. Signing the papers. Read through all paperwork and then remember that it's a really good day because you're taking ownership of a new property. Chapter 9. Time for champagne. Buying a house is a big victory for you, me, and anyone who is building a passive income through real estate. Victories should be celebrated. When you buy a property, pat yourself on the shoulder, go have a nice dinner, and most importantly, enjoy a nice glass of champagne. Few people do what we do so a lot of people will have a hard time understanding. When people don't understand, they tend to be very moderate with compliments. It's probably more common that they give you bad advice or tell you what's wrong with your goals, investments, and ambitions. Don't let this get to you. Compliment yourself by celebrating your successes and avoid letting negativity influence you. Chapter 10, about sweat equity and repairs and maintenance. There are a lot of different ways of doing repairs and maintenance and figuring out what's worth doing and what you shouldn't do and how to do it. YouTube has a lot of tips and tricks on, on how to perform a lot of the tasks if you want to do some of them yourselves. When it comes to doing them yourselves or not, I usually look at what the alternative cost would be. Like if I can go do another job that makes me more money than it would cost to get help with the repairs, I might hire someone for the repairs. If I can't make more money elsewhere than I have to pay, for doing the repairs, I might try to go do as much as possible myself. Chapter 11, finding tenants. Do you want to be the property manager or hire a property manager to do the job for you? Hiring someone to find tenants takes a load off your shoulders, which can make life as an investor a lot easier, but you will make less money. The goal when searching for tenants is to find a good fit for your place. Someone you think will appreciate staying there, has the money to pay for it, and won't wear your house to the ground. 
The easiest way to reach potential tenants is through online advertising. An important thing to keep in mind when going through the process is to avoid discriminating. My preferred way to keep it safe and under control is to limit all communication to email only. That way, I don't say anything I haven't thought through. Once I find someone who seems like a good fit, I go ahead and schedule a showing at the property. I have realized that there is a lot of gut feeling and general perception involved. One of the first things I look at is how they park, and how they keep their cars. If they fly in and park in a weird spot with a messy car, they tend to have a hard time understanding systems and keeping clean. Those are bad traits for renters. If they have a clean and well-maintained car and park it where you would expect people to park, they are taking care of their own things and they respect systems. Good traits for renters. I then show them around while trying to make sure they aren't lying about themselves by asking general questions. Before they leave, I take the information needed for background and credit checks, then tell them that I will get back in touch. The final step is to look at their background. You can search arrest records, check their Facebook, look at their credit, and if you feel insecure, pay for a more thorough background check online. When I find people who seem like a good fit and who make enough money to pay rent, I meet with them again and sign a lease. Chapter 12, Managing Tenants. It's a tricky game. It tends to get very emotional at times, but keep it cool. I keep all our communication with the tenants to text or, or emails because then we have it all in writing and there's no miscommunication that can be brought up, brought up later. And uh, sometimes we use property managers, which can be very nice because you create like a buffer between you and the tenants which makes it a lot easier and, and you get all that emotional stuff away but it's also going to cost you a bit of, of money chapter 13 setting up your business use help professionals do these things really well and they're not usually that expensive i use um, professionals to do my bookkeeping and to setting up the business and to look through the paperwork as it's so expensive and so hard to deal with getting those things wrong that it's usually not worth risking it. Chapter 14, buying a second house. Repeat this whole process again. Chapter 15, when things go wrong. They inevitably do. Sometimes we all hit roadblocks and stuff that doesn't work out the way we planned or wanted them to. But that doesn't mean it's game over at all. Just learn how to deal with setbacks and, and issues and then you'll soon be on your way to your next success again. And finally, chapter 16, by my wife, about when to go full time. While on the fence about my career, I took a trip to California to help a friend start a business. It was on that trip I met Lars. Lucky for me, Lars was a real estate investor who kept things simple. There were no get-rich-quick schemes or horror stories, but simple math, proper expectations, and a good philosophy. It was a breath of fresh air. Knowing that I wanted to replace my job with real estate within a specific time frame was important because I knew my number. I knew the cash flow I needed to make the jump from corporate employee to self-employed. Some people ask me how I knew when to transition into full-time real estate. Everyone's situation will be very specific, and I think the individual's ability to manage risk should be properly evaluated. For me, I knew to jump when the fear of staying at my job surpassed the fear of leaving. Then there's the final word where I try to motivate and push a little bit for you to get started. <laughs> That's about all there is to it. Now, uh, the book is where you'll get all this information and so much more. 
uh, it's available on amazon.com or any of the Amazon platforms, UK, in Germany, in Japan, in Australia, wherever you are, there'll be one near you. And uh, it's also available as an audiobook, a Kindle or a paperback. And uh, go buy it.